Good morning, everybody. My name is Alessio Bolognesi. I'm the technical officer for digital agriculture in Federuna Coma, the Italian Association of Agricultural Machinery Manufacturers. And I'm honored today to be here to moderate this discussion about uh, a hot topic, I would say, in uh, uh, agricultural robotics, which is related to regulation, standardization, such a kind of things. So the market of agricultural robotics, we already heard that before, is increasing very fast. Uh, it was about 6 billion euros in 2022, more or less, mostly dedicated to milking machines and uh, breeding machines, such a kind of stuff. And the provision is to have a double market by 2025. It should be about $12 billion. And the part related to agricultural machinery is increasing very fast and will become mostly a half of the, of the uh, world market. But this increasing market is opening also new questions, new burdens and new hurdles for both the OEMs, the manufacturers, and the farmers. Starting from farmers, I would say they're buying their first robots. They have to integrate them into their farms. And these robots are usually have to work with other traditional machines, maybe robots from other manufacturers in the next future, and humans. And they have to be, work together in an integrated way, I would say in an interoperable way. It's a word we are going to say maybe uh, a little bit more later on. And this is now a little bit a problem because many agricultural robots are working in their kind of closed and protected environment. And this is reasonable. It is reasonable from the OEM perspective because there's a lack of a regulatory framework and uh, there's no certainty of standards if they are there. And so so for safety reasons, there are these closed environments which are a little bit impeding this integration. On the other end, the farmer wants to have these interoperable solutions. But it's not just integration and safety of the machine in the, uh, in the, in the view of agricultural robotics. There are other aspects which uh, will be impacted in the, in the close future. Uh, topics like cybersecurity, for example, or regulation on artificial intelligence which are coming uh, in different countries. So all of those topics will be part of our discussion today with our guests. I'm going to introduce uh, all the speakers to this panel, starting from uh, Mr. Card Blaze, the Senior Vice President of AEM, <laughs> the Association of Equipment Manufacturing in North America. Please, a warm welcome to Mr. Card Blaze. Come on, warm up a little bit. Welcome to Mr. Andrew Oliver uh, from CNH Industrial and a chairman of the Agricultural Industry Electronic Foundation, AEF. Welcome, Mr. Oliver. Please welcome Mr. Christophe Tissier, uh, technical advisor at SEMA, the uh, European Association of Machine Manufacturers. Welcome, Mr. Tissier. And please welcome Mr. Yoshiyuki Kawase, coordinator on the Department of Safety and Evaluation and Standardization at National Agriculture and Food Research Organization Institute of Agriculture and Machinery. Quite long. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Mr. Kawase. And remotely, if we, if we have the connection, hello and welcome, Mr. Uh, Rowan Rainbow, Managing Director, Crop Protection Australia. Welcome to be, and uh, thanks for being with us remotely. Okay, I'm going to start with the first question round. I please you to introduce a little bit better yourself who, and who you are representing here. I start from my uh, uh, closest uh, guest here, Mr. Blades. Uh, so coming, uh, if we talk about this... Uh, rising uh, market and uh, where these robots are uh, deployed all around the world. Uh, so it's not just a matter of having them working you know, in Europe or uh, just uh, limited in the US and so on. All the industry is moving towards the wide adoption of these robots. So 
how important is the cooperation of all the manufacturers are around the world and how uh, it's important they have to move as a sole entity to, let's say, push this uh, new area, this new industry to rise? Well, thank this way? This way? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's work. So thank you for the question, and thank you for the opportunity to share here. Um, you know, the question is, is essentially, you know, how important is it for us to cooperate? Yeah. How important is it for us to organize and to, and to, and to consolidate as much as we can? And I, I'll tell you, if, if, there's, if there's one message that I think will come loud and clear out of this whole conversation is that um, it's, it's imperative that we, that we organize and that we have some you know, consolidation of ideas, standards, regulations, uh, you know, across the board, and we'll, we'll cover a, a wide range of things. You know, it's, you know, if you, a startup company, a startup robotics company, you know, just by in, its inherent nature, you kind of want to, you know, be a little bit of a nomad, maybe be a little bit of a lone wolf. That's why you got into that business, uh, which is very exciting for a startup company. But quickly we recognize that, that uh, uh, much like the previous panel discussion where we were talking about maybe changing uh, changing row widths to match a specific brand and maybe that brand is not going to be around too much longer. Uh, that's not good for the, a good experience for the end user. So it's incredibly important that we, we quickly align around standards uh, and, and, and align around some, some global consistency to address all of the other concerns that we're going to talk about uh, later on. I think it's really important in the agriculture industry, but we also, when having this same conversation, have got to look to other industries that are also very similar. Uh, you know, we're talking about agriculture here, but you know, the, uh, a, a robot that's that's uh, that's you know tilling the soil might have similar applications in construction or in mining, and those standards kind of also need to be aligned cross sector as well, which becomes very interesting. So I bring that point um, to us from uh, from my perspective, setting uh, leading uh, North America f uh, ag and uh, construction for the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. We're a, a, a trade association in, in North America representing OEMs in the supply chain, really talking about a lot of these, these, uh, these very topics. It's a, just a, such a passion point for us to talk about certainly doing global standards, doing them once, doing them right, uh, but then also addressing some of the topics that came up with the previous conversation, which is uh, doing it for the right reasons. We're involved in agriculture because it's kind of in our blood but we also recognize that uh, we have a, a higher calling of, of uh, leaving the world better than we found it. So, thank you. Okay, th so you think that we have to move with the other industry towards the uh, authorities as well and standardization in order to have much more weight and strong uh, strength in... You know, Co uh, correct, and I think working, it's not, uh, you know, maybe it's an eye on the other industries because mm -hmm. sometimes it makes sense to consolidate and coordinate and sometimes it doesn't. But to your, to your point, it's really with uh, the added benefit of adding all of that weight together gives us a solid voice. Um, okay. you know, we, can, we can speak to the, to the additional benefits later, but it's really about having that consolidated solid voice uh, from an advocacy standpoint, from a standard standpoint. It just makes the story a lot more uh, powerful and a lot easier to tell. Thank you. And I, I would jump to the other side of the world, maybe. Uh, I would jump to, to Japan for uh, having some kind of insight from there. Because I remember I was in NATO in 2013 for an ISO meeting in Tokyo. And I remember we visited NATO and there were the first rice combines, the first planters and tractors running autonomously for the first test, maybe. And how far are the now the agricultural robots in Japan from those uh, those uh, prototypes, and uh, how did uh, the robotics evolve in Japan in in these years? Okay, sorry. Um, thank you, uh, thank you for having me uh, and inviting me into this uh, workshop. Um, uh, so. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce what I do. Uh, I uh, belong to the Institute of Agriculture and Machinery. Uh, my institute is focused on agriculture machinery. We do um, research and development as also, but uh, we are a testing station. Uh, we're a certified OECD tractor uh, testing station, and uh, we are the only uh, institution that does uh, testing and certification 
in Japan for agriculture machinery. So um, as you uh, in the past seen uh, prototypes of uh, robots, uh, combined harvesters, tractors, rice transplanters in Japan. Um, the situation right now is that uh, uh, some of the machines are already in the market. We have um, robot tractors sold, uh, robot rice transplanters sold. And for uh, um, certification, our institution does a uh, safety test for agricultural robots. Uh, we certify uh, tr uh, robot tractors and robot rice transplanters and uh, last year we just uh, issued the uh, test code for uh, grain dryers. It's a, not a machine, it's more of a facility, but uh, it's for a uh, remote um, uh, uh, surveillance mm -hmm. testing code. So um, it, it is a growing uh, Industry, we have a lot of um, auto driving, uh, steering, uh, tractors, combiner harvester, rice transplanters, but um, uh, for the uh, certified uh, tractors, I believe we have four robot tractors certified, uh, two uh, rice transplanters. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's a growing market right now. So, do you know how many uh, agricultural robots are now deployed on the market in, in Japan, or do you have um, numbers? Um, I, I don't have the exact numbers, okay. uh, but um, it is a, uh, as uh, the discussion um, in the first uh, workshop they had, you know, how to introduce these machines. Um, luckily, our government have uh, a project to fund. Uh, farmers to uh, buy these machines and start their business using these uh, agriculture robots. And in this project, we, what we do is that we uh, uh, fund these farmers and the farmers will actually uh, work and use these robots in the fields and they will report back how much they have um, uh, plus in income, all the um, uh, data that the other farmers want to see, like how much it's going to cost, how much it's going to, uh, the total revenue and all that. So we have a project going on and it's, uh, we have uh, deployed a lot of um, uh, uh, projects throughout Japan, not just in uh, uh, robot tractors, but more into uh, smart uh, farming okay. technologies also. Thank you, Mr. Kawase. Then we'll move back to Europe a little bit, and uh, I'd like to talk with uh, Mr. Tissier from the SEMA, which is representing very well all the industry towards the European Commission, Parliament, Council, and for all the regulatory aspects. And there are many upcoming new regulations impacting this uh, rising <laughs> star uh, of agricultural robotics. And, uh, could you give us an idea what is going to happen in the next month and years? Yeah, uh, yeah. G good morning, everybody. Um, indeed, um, th th the working uh, program of the Commission, uh, of the European Commission, uh, which will be renewed actually uh, after uh, in June of uh, next year. Uh, the, the work program was really to um, dedicate it to uh, develop regulation on new technologies which targets artificial intelligence, autonomy, uh, internet of things, so uh, um, uh, data, cyber resilience. And uh, I will focus on three main regulations. The first one is the machinery regulation. It's um, uh, it's a revision of an existing uh, regulation in application at the present time in Europe. So it targets machines. Machines are power units uh, fitted with, uh, with a, a tool which uh, enables uh, this equipment to carry out a specific task. And so I, I really give this definition because uh, tar tractors are not in the scope of this machinery regulation. And it is a very important point because at the present time, we do not have any technical requirements for uh, autonomous tractors. Um, and uh, then there is a big question behind it also, what is an autonomous tractor? And should we mirror 
uh, the split we have, the legal split we have in Europe between tractors and uh, machinery. Um, so this machinery uh, regulation um, was published last year in June of 2023. It will uh, apply um, uh, to manufacturers so for the design and the construction of machinery uh, in January 2027. And uh, the, the evolutions brought compared to the existing machinery directive uh, covers so autonomy, uh, cyber resilience or cyber safety, sorry, uh, protection against corruption, um, uh, and the third point, uh, very important, is the integration of uh, artificial intelligence uh, modules, which would carry out um, a safety function. There has been many discussions actually to avoid to use the, the word artificial intelligence in this machinery regulation. Uh, so we try to restrict as much as possible uh, this wording and to use something which is, <laughs> which will look very theoretical, but we are using fully or partially uh, self-evolving uh, systems using machine learning techniques ensuring uh, safety function. The idea behind this wording is to restrict as much as possible uh, the use of this machinery regulation to, uh, well, uh, the, uh, the idea is to restrict as much as possible um, the type of validation which needs to be done for this equipment. Um, and I mean by that, that um, uh, systems self-evolving without the use of a manufacturer, without the validation of uh, an operator for a safety function, we need to be validated by an external, uh, by an external party, so a notified body, uh, which is uh, in some way different from most of the cases of machinery uh, for, uh, which needs to be validated under self-certification. So uh, for, um, normally for uh, a robot, an agricultural robot, uh, the validation is done by the manufacturer himself and uh, so he will prepare a technical file and uh, all the technical solutions in front of his risk assessment will be present uh, in his uh, technical file. So I make then a loop with the second regulation and indirectly I mentioned it. Um, this regulation is uh, targeting artificial intelligence and why it, is really, it was really important to restrict in the machine regulation the wording is because the um, uh, AI regulation, which is to be published normally um, uh, at the, mid the middle of the year uh, of this year, um, we are introducing a notion of high risk AI. And uh, with this high risk AI, we need to uh, verify additional aspects. Uh, for example, the transparency of, uh, of the behavior of, uh, of the AI. Uh, we need to allow uh, the, um, the, uh, the uh, an automatic record of some events. Uh, we need to ensure some, um, uh, some resistance to uh, external uh, attacks and to ensure that in case of cyber, um, cyb cyber attacks, the behavior of the AI system will not be impacted. So um, all these additional aspects would need to be considered uh, for, uh, in case such a module would be included in a machinery. The third uh, regulation, uh, it's what we call Cyber Resilience Act and is intended to cover so, cyber security. The publication is, is planned also for the middle of this year. And um, it, in, it is intended to cover uh, all the vulnerabilities when there are some external um, influences, whether they are intended or not and uh, to ensure that uh, your product will uh, behave properly. Um, it is really, this is really an important regulation uh, and it will have a big impact on machinery because it's not just a, a question of software and uh, providing some 
uh, components certified by uh, suppliers, but the whole structure and architecture of your system, will, of your machine, will need to be um, uh, checked again to ensure that it complies with this regulation. Thank you, Mr. Tissi. So maybe the scenario is not getting clearer, but of course more regulated in the, in the, in the future. So um, we, uh, we learned something about what's happening from a regulatory perspective, but we mentioned before that uh, robots are not working alone in the field. Um, maybe we're, we're thinking about a scenario in which the, the farmer is at home uh, watching TV and from time to time look to the smartphone what the machine is doing, but maybe this is still utopia right now, right? But there are standards and other activities which could help to reach that kind of, of, of scenarios. Uh, and, but today these robots are working with other robots, maybe other machines with ISOBUS, maybe on board, and some, something like that. So, Mr. Oliver, uh, so first I would like you to explain what AEF is and what it does, and what do you think are, what will be the key factors in the, in the close future of agricultural robotics from the AEF perspective? Um, thank you, Alessio. Yeah, so, um, I'm here representing the, the AEF, uh, I'm the chairman of this group. It was formed in around 2008. And the reason why the AEF was formed was because there was a great standard on electronic uh, compatibility developed in the late 90s and was first released in the year 2000. And that standard was ISO 11783, or more commonly known as ISOBUS. And the whole idea, that the beauty behind ISOBUS was that I could develop a tractor, I could put a display in that tractor, Kurt could develop an implement, and anybody could develop impl implements, but if we all followed this common electronic protocol, then the electronics on the implement could talk to any tractor, and we had this interoperability. And that was the, 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 the fantastic thing about ISOBUS, is it promised interoperability. And by having electronics on our implements, they could be smarter. They could start engaging in that wonderful world of precision farming. Um, so let's say ISOBUS evolved. We had the standard release. But when people were developing their software, things, things weren't working together. Mm -hmm. And so that's why in 2008, well, the talks actually started a bit sooner, a bit earlier. Um, seven ag equipment manufacturers and two trade associations got together and said, we've got to do something. We need to form a voluntary organization so we can collaborate on technical issues on ISOBUS and make them better. And from there, from 2008, and, and you know, essentially nine, uh, nine companies and associations participating, we're now up to you know, around 280 member companies participating in the AEF. And really, the whole thing about the AEF is it's a, a voluntary organization. Companies choose to belong, and they choose to allow their, their engineers or their product marketing people or their product support people some time to participate in AEF project teams. And the AEF project teams meet to look at compatibility issues on the ice of us and work out solutions which are documented in, in guidelines. And we've found over the years, you know, from 2008 to today, the amount of ISOBUS compatibility on the market has rapidly gone up. Um, obviously, that's thanks to the work of the AEF. That's also thanks to the fact that, you know, everybody's realized that ISOBUS is actually useful as a standard. Um, ISOBUS promises interoperability between mixed fleets and you know, for all of us in Europe, mixed fleets are a reality for those who come from the other side of the pond. In most cases, you can try and have the same color on the front and the back of the hitch. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, um, but the strange thing is that even over there, ISOBUS is used by a lot of um, third party smaller players. They found that by having an ISOBUS product, they can connect to the main tractors on the market. So. Basically, we've got the AEF, we've got ISOBUS, we've got interoperability. 
Um, and if you think of this, this kind of, let's say, this utopia of the farmer sitting at home watching TV, just checking up how his autonomous machines are doing on his phone, it's a great idea, but without interoperability, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Correct. You know? yeah. And um, so let's say we spoke about mixed fleets. Um, if you think to the future, Yes, there will still be mixed fleets, but it won't be just different colors of mixed fleets. It'll be mixed fleets of some things will be manned machines and some things will be unmanned or autonomous machines. And, you know, they all have to, they all have to work together. And in the end, from the farmer point of view, he doesn't just kind of throw out all his equipment and go and buy a fully autonomous fleet. You know, he starts buying bits at a time to help with certain operations. So again, it's that interoperability between manned and unmanned machines. That's what we need. Otherwise, it's, you know, we'll end up going forward, if you like, on two different paths. Slightly parallel, but there'll be two separate paths. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. And um, I'd like to go back to regulatory aspects, and then we'll be back to uh, interoperability matters later on. Uh, I'd like uh, first uh, to, to make a first question to Mr. Rainbow. Uh, maybe it's an open one, and then if you agree, I'll leave you the floor at the end for uh, some slides. Uh, well, that would be much easier from your side as you are remotely connected. So I, I, we, we listen about the, the situation and the, uh, let's say, opinion and perspective from many countries on, around the world. I would like to know something about Australia, what's going on in agricultural robotics, what is Australia government maybe uh, from a regulatory aspect doing, and uh, what's your vision? Yeah, thank, thank you, Alessia. The, the, um, in, in Australia, we don't have specific uh, regulations for agricultural robotics, but it's principally managed um, by a series of other regulations, particularly around work, health and safety. And um, un unfortunately, we're a federation of states in Australia, so that's on a state-by-state -state basis. So we've got to get all seven states to agree to similar uh, standards in that regard. Um, and shortly, I'll, I'll share a presentation about what we've tried to do from an industry point of view, working together to address a cohesive approach to address, I suppose, the lack of a regulatory framework. Um, but we are quite fortunate. We've actually had a lot of experience in automation in the Australian mining industry. The Australian mining industry is probably some of the most sophisticated in the world and has some of the most advanced automation. And so we've actually been able to uh, glean a lot of learnings from that particular industry and how it was approached and how the government actually embraced and supported and endorsed uh, the industry codes of practice that are developed there. And that's been particularly helpful um, I, I might uh, uh, just stop there. Did you want me to share my presentation now? Because it'll probably just help sort of see the, the future questions. Is that how you'd like to proceed, Alessi? Excuse me? Didn't I get you? The Would question? you like me to, to share my presentation uh, now? May, Maybe later on at the end would be, uh, okay. would be more easy. So, uh, but I just wanted to make this uh, introductory question to you, and I leave you the floor at the end for the for the presentation, if you agree. Okay. So thanks in, um, for for this first uh, insight. I'll go back to Mr. Blaze and to well, North America in general. Uh, so. Well, we heard that in Europe it's not just the safety aspects of agricultural robotic are impacting the, the sector. It's also a, matters related to cybersecurity or whatsoever. So which are in, the, uh, in North America the regulation impacted the sectors and what maybe is missing and what will be coming in the future? Well, thank you for the question. And as we look at North America, the regulatory environment in North America is clearly very different than the, re than the regulatory environment in Europe. And in many ways, Dr. Rainbow mentioning the Federation of States in, in Australia, uh, similar to, uh, to what we deal with in the United States. Um, so we're, you know, it's, it's challenging. There's kind of a less of a, uh, of a heavy hand on some cases and, uh, than, than maybe what, what we're dealing with here in Europe. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, that the, the, the needs don't, don't still apply. I mean, I think you know, we all want to do the same things. And we're a global market. So if we're building something for Europe, 
I'm going to follow the European standards, and those kind of by default become global standards. Or if a standard uh, develops in another nation with a global company, you kind of by default follow that standard. So that's sort of the, 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 the state of play as we relate to in the United States. But one thing I would, do want to point out that's, that uh, you mentioned a couple of things in the question, cybersecurity. I know Dr. Rainbow mentioned uh, safety concerns. I think what, one thing we need to pay attention to really strongly here uh, in this particular space is those that are uh, uh, attempting to regulate this market, this emerging market, may not be the typical actors that we're used to dealing with from a regulatory standpoint. I'll use the example in the United States, uh, in the, in the, uh, the state of, of California. Uh, automation, autonomic, uh, autonomous vehicles are, or autonomous equipment are currently not able to be sold in the, into the state of California because of uh, the OSHA uh, uh, regulator. Not a group that we in agriculture are used to working with at all. Uh, and the motivation to prevent that sale has very little to do with you know, the, the economic viability of the robots or environmental benefits of the robots or even the efficiency that comes from it. It has a lot to do with protecting the special interest of labor unions. Mm -hmm. And so when we kind of look at all of these regulations, we might have some of, you know, a, a different set of uh, uh, people on the other side of our arguments that we're not used to, uh, to, to arguing with. So that's why it's incredibly important for us to, again, to the previous point, we all gotta work together because the enemies are not in this room yeah. The enemies are, are not are, 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 are outside of this room, and we kind of have to have a unified voice uh, if we're going to advance this cause. Well, th thank you. I'd like to, let's you know, say, trigger the discussion you, 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 you introduced by mentioning the state of California about the labor saving and such a kind of stuff. So is there concern about the impact of agricultural robots on labor in, in, in North America? <laughs> that's, a, that's a tricky question. So I'll, I'll try to navigate this in a way that doesn't <laughs> offend anybody, but I can't guarantee I won't. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, is there a concern with, with labor and, and, and agriculture in, in general? I think we all agree, those of us that are employed with agriculture, know that there is a shortage of workers. That's just a, that's just a truism. And was mentioned in your opening comments that the robotics started uh, to really see its adoption first in milking because milking is where the biggest labor challenge was. It seems like there's other areas, uh, to pardon the, the, the pun here, that are ripe for uh, further automation because they are very labor intense. Those markets that are labor intense in the, uh, in the state of California would be vegetable harvesting, fruit harvesting, stuff that's done by manual labor and done by manual labor that oftentimes uh, involves uh, migrant workers. Um, that's where it gets to be a very politically charged issue uh, because if you are replacing migrant workers with, uh, with a machine, um, you kind of get into some social economic challenges that in some cases are very unpopular to deal with. And, and, and that's potentially uh, uh, influencing regulations that might stifle the adoption of that technology. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, the, the question came because I think to the, uh, to the lack of labor in Europe for picking, harvesting, such a kind of stuff. So it's really re related to that. Um, and uh, continuing with, to, this, to this topic, I'd like to go back to Mr. Tissier about also the safety of workers, which is under concern of the, of the regulators. And it, it is also a concern for our own industry. So what, what's your, your view at the SEMA view and maybe also the SEMA activity uh, in the perspective of safety of workers where agricultural robots are coming? So first, first maybe um, just to state that uh, in the machinery regulation, we are I introducing uh, now uh, the role of supervisor so uh, which, with a, a person who has to, to supervise the, uh, the work. And uh, in addition to this definition, we have also uh, some requirements to what is called supervisory function. Supervisory function are some uh, activities uh, associated to, um, for the supervisor, but only uh, when the machine is in a, its uh, autonomous mode. 
So of course, introducing uh, such functions, uh, it's not mandatory, it's function, but it can be used uh, on, a, on a machine. Uh, but introducing this, um, uh, this function and uh, uh, introducing also uh, this role of supervisor uh, has, of course, an impact uh, on, on, uh, on the work site. Um, on our side for the deployment, actually, on, on these machines, we indeed uh, initiated some, some discussions. We are really in the early discussions on, on these aspects. Uh, we really focused on following the, the machinery regulation first, uh, then uh, working on trying to, to work, and I will come back later, uh, on uh, use cases, and really uh, starting to work on dedicated requirements for specific uh, use cases. And the third task is indeed to have some, some discussions about uh, what would be called a code of practice. Should we have one for, for Europe? Should we work with um, the, the European organization representing users to, to have a code of practice as it, is, as it was developed in Australia or, for example, in UK? It's one of the points which, uh, which on our table for this year and I assume the, the next year as well. Thank you, Mr. Tissier. And then uh, I go back with, to the uh, standards and regulations um, because uh, we did a lot of discussion at INSEMAI as well, starting from available standards coming from Japan. And there is a new series, which is the 18497, in, uh, coming maybe in the next in the next month, hopefully. Uh, so, and. Uh, do you think, do you think it, it, it is going to be useful for the industry as a guideline for safety and how it is, uh, let's say, it, it's going to be adopted in Japan by manufacturers as well? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, um, uh, like in, uh, in Japan, the uh, testing for agricultural robots is focused on safety. Um, we do not... Uh, evaluate the performance. It is too uh, complicated. So we focus on safety. Um, <clears throat> uh, with uh, ISO 18497, um, uh, it's in uh, our revision at the current moment. Um, but um, the last version was in 2018. So since that, uh, a lot of technologies have evolved. A lot of different types of machines are sold in the market. So. Um, and I believe it will be updated uh, with the uh, uh, technologies today with the re revision. And uh, uh, hopefully these, um, uh, this standard will, uh, ha will guide the manufacturers uh, to design machines uh, that uh, uh, will follow uh, for um, uh, safety reasons. OK. And well, we. 18497 is mostly related to automated functions. It doesn't talk about the whole machine. And functions are all also in the focus of AF. And if I think of functionality is a better word, maybe. Uh, there are so many, started from the TIM, for example, which is really the first step in automation uh, in, uh, in, in our industry. Uh, between, uh, uh, you know, machine of different brands. Uh, but there are other functionalities which are coming, which could be suitable for uh, autonomous machine and agricultural robots. Could you tell us a little bit more about those? Yeah, um, thank you, Alessio. So, yeah, one of the, let's say, one of the key goals of the AEF, and I think we've succeeded somewhat, is to try and make ISOBUS more understandable I mean, if you look at the standard, it's 11783, 14 parts, and you know, each part is a few hundred pages. Um, so it, it's a lot to read, and, and for anybody who actually wants to buy an ISOBUS product, the question has been, what does it actually do? So when the AEF was formed, we sat down, one of the first things we did is we sat down and thought, how can we make it easier from the communication point of view? And so we, we came up with this functionality concept, and we call them funnily enough, ISOBUS functionalities. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, engineering trying to be slightly commercial, and this is as far as we've got. Um, but the point is that, that with these functionalities, the idea is you see a blue square on the tractor, you know that it supports the universal terminal functionality. You see the blue square on the implement, and you know, oh, that also supports the universal terminal functionality. So if I, if I plug those two products together on the ISA bus, I can operate the implement with the terminal that I've got on the tractor. And yeah, we developed a, a database which is open to the industry to look up their products and see what certified functionalities they have. And to fill the database, you actually have to pass a conformance test for your certified product. So we kind of, we did actually look at the whole picture. We just weren't so clever on the nice marketing names. Um, but in the end, we've got functionalities, we've got a conformance test, and we've got a database where you can look up certified products. Some of the latest, if you like, functionalities that were released on the ISABUS, one of them is actually TIM, or Tractor Implement Management. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of you know, ISABUS Class 3, where the implement can automatically control tractor functions. One of the problems with Class 3 was that everybody was releasing their proprietary solutions. And so, again, it was the need of the AEF to come up with a, what's a way that we can certify TIM products so that a TIM product from one manufacturer can automatically control a tractor from another manufacturer. How do we address the, the functional safety, the liability concerns, etc.? cetera? And, and that led to the development of this TIM functionality. And, and there are TIM products out there today. So again, you put enough sensors on the implement, you allow it to think for itself, and it can automatically control the tractor speed or the tractor steering or the tractor hydraulics. And so it's a step on the road to autonomy. One of the things about Tim is that you still actually have to have someone in the operator's seat. Tim has been designed to have the, the presence of the operator. Obviously, looking to the future, if you like, we need to evolve that. We need to evolve to a, a further generation of Tim where the operator is not there anymore or he's sitting in the office or at the edge of the field or the coffee shop or you know, wherever he likes to do his business. Um, sorry, wherever they like to do their business. Um, so if you think about functionalities, you think about the evolution of TIM, that's one thing that can be used in autonomy. The AEF also has some other project teams working on some really key pieces which will also be useful in autonomy. We have a group working on high-speed ISABUS, and what we're talking about is an ethernet that would run, a common ethernet that would run between the tractor and the implement. And so we're talking about a bus speed which is 4,000 times faster than the current speed of, of ISA bus, which is based on CAN bus. And you think about that 4,000 times faster, what, how much information you could put down there and the th things you could do. So we've got the high-speed ISA bus team, we've got the wireless infield communication team, and they're working on having a, if you like, a standard of wireless communication of machines which are working in the same field, but again, coming from different manufacturers. And within the wireless, communi wireless uh, communication team, there is actually a use case which is really for autonomy. So it's one machine being close enough to another one machine to actually start controlling that machine's speed or direction. And obviously, the, the, the easy scenario there is the, um, the combine unloading into the grain cart. So we've got HSI, we've got WIC, um, we've got a team working on digital camera solutions. And again, you know, from, for the uh, autonomy application, you need a lot of cameras, you need a lot of images, you need to get them in one place for processing. And so this digital camera team is really looking at that. What's the best way um, to, if you like, standardize on digital camera systems to allow all these possibilities. And then finally, we've got one more team, uh, which is called a Agon. And the whole idea about Agon is that we know that you know, we're successful with um, getting manufacturers to cooperate on interoperability within the field. But there's obviously this really huge need for having interoperability between cl clouds. And so we have a project team, they're working on Agon, and Agon is going to be a standardized way of allowing clouds to connect. Um, and similar to what we have with ISABUS today, the kind of premise behind Agon is that you have to be a certified partner. You have to pass a, a conformance test for your cloud and, and with standard APIs, and then you'll be able to connect to anybody else 
who is certified within that network. And so looking to the autonomy situation, obviously you end up having uh, software to control the autonomous fleet. And so there'll be a need for software to get in, into that cloud and from that cloud, from existing manufacturer cloud. So that's where AGIN is another useful activity which we're working on within the AEF. Thank you. So, well, it looks like many pieces of the puzzle are going to place to meet the, the needs of the, of the farmers, basically, to, 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 to develop those scenarios we talked about in the several and different use cases we are facing around the world. Uh, I'd like to make another quick round of questions and uh, before leaving the room to Mr. Rainbow for the presentation, first one to, to you, Mr. Blades. Uh, just uh, to well, I say follow up what you already presented, is there any critical aspect you see in the future of agricultural robotics in terms of, I don't know, any aspect of safety or whatever? I don't know, maybe. Thank, thank you. And so I'll, I'll kind of react to that in a number of different ways and, and frankly kind of build off of what, what uh, uh, Andrew was, was speaking to. Uh, it goes with the central theme of what I said, whatever we're responding. We've all got to work together. Um, and and it's, it's imperative that we all, got to, that we all work together. Uh, you know, because you know, I, I came from the United States, and I tell a little story here. I came from the United States, uh, and I, lof, I left my uh, power converter at home, uh, the one that I needed to, uh, to plug in my computer. And uh, so I was trying to figure out how to, to make my power work. Well, wouldn't it be great if when you travel in an airplane, you didn't have to have a different plug for every country. Um, that would be awesome. It seems to make a lot of sense. But that, that, uh, that standard in each country is so entrenched, we're never going to get there. So the time is now for us to begin to work on standards and interoperability, using some of the framework as, as, uh, as, as Andrew pointed out, AEF has kind of got all these work streams that sort of line all of this up. So my, my, I guess my, my, my request, my ask, especially to those that are in the, in the startup space or in the, uh, the OEM space for, uh, uh, for, for new robotics, collaborate as much as you possibly can uh, and, and try to come up with a uniform platform that we can all work on. The AEF uh, platform is certainly one that, that, uh, that, that we endorse and, and, and stand very firmly behind and it seems as if it's kind of the right platform to get behind. But it's just imperative to not be a lone wolf out there because at some point the farmer is going to be the one who pays the price if we don't work together. And could be a message for the, you, the startups and the young companies to start yesterday, not today, because otherwise it will be too late. Exactly. To when, the when's the best time to, uh, to plant a tree? Yesterday. Yeah. Uh, when's, the, you know, when's the second best day? today. And it's kind of the same way with organizing around standards and cooperation and interoperability. The best day is yesterday. If you didn't do it yesterday, then we better start today. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Kawase, the, another critical aspect when you talk about agricultural robotics is, are they supposed to go on the road? <laughs> no, we have mother regulation in Europe. There are regulations about uh, machinery go, go, going on public roads around the world. So what is the situation in Japan, and what do you think could happen with agricultural robots? Okay, um, in Japan, uh, we have robot tractors. They have, uh, we have to drive them to the field. Uh, so you can't drive an autonomous tractor when it's switched off on the public road. Uh, you can't switch it on on the road. But and you bring it down, uh, you switch it on, you, uh, you let it run, and it's unmanned, uh, but you need a operator inside or beside the field to uh, make sure that nothing happens. So uh, the situation is a little bit different by each country. And, um, oh, sorry, what was the question? No, what's in Japan, the view in, in perspective of uh, yeah, uh, autonomous machine yeah. running so, on the road, and um, is there something in, planned? In, in um, considering uh, more efficiency, it is way better for the tractor to run autonomous, autonomously on the road and going to the field by itself and working, and coming back. That's the best uh, efficiency. But on the road, it's probably regulated by cars. 
uh, our uh, tractor industry is very small compared to car industry. So that regulation is um, uh, made up in uh, WP29. Um, and uh, uh, I don't think uh, it's going to be very difficult for um, tractor manufacturers to follow the standard of cars. It's, it's going to be very high. So um, it, it's, it's a work in progress, but uh, it's kind of very difficult, I think. It's a very di difficult task. Um, and, uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, it, it is the, the direction that I think is going to go. And um, uh, one of the points that in this is that there are many regulations that uh, like we've discussed that uh, in the um, <coughs> uh, other uh, 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 construction site regulations, mm -hmm. uh, those regulations also has to kind of um, uh, collaborate, uh, collaborate with our agriculture robot industries also. We don't want to have many different standards that is totally different. We want to have a unified one. So, um, and again, we should work together and as fast as we can and early as we can, yeah. Thank you, well, I believe the message working together even with the other, other industries is, is coming out very strong from this, uh, from this panic here. Last question to uh, Mr. Tissier about, well, we heard about working together, having common standards and so on. So what are the activities of SEMA in that perspective of standardization and uh, towards the new uh, regulatory framework? Yeah, <clears throat> maybe I will start to say one thing. There is a distinction between regulation and standardization. Regulation well, let's say in my mind, but I assume it most of the minds, is a mandatory text. You need to comply with some uh, requirements. That can be very general, but it's mandatory. And the standard is one solution, uh, and generally, it's, most of the time, it's voluntary. Uh, what we have described, I think, among all of us, are uh, we have sometimes several different regulations to comply with. So if a manufacturer wants to sell in, on different markets, he, he will have to be aware of all these different regulations. And our target is using standards to have a common solution to, to be able to answer to all these regulations. It's one way to answer to these regulations, uh, but uh, as generally manufacturers are involved, in these uh, standards, it, they can really integrate this, uh, this approach. Having said that, uh, we have indeed this approach, I would say, two, two main aspects. First, a common work uh, with other organizations, so it's not only with European um, uh, manufacturers that we are working for these uh, robots, and we call it autonomous functions. But uh, we have a specific group uh, dedicated, of course, for, the, for this aspect. And we work f with AEM members and with uh, members of JAMA um, uh, because we want to have a worldwide solution. And the intent is to work on safety standards, uh, which, which would brought uh, to, uh, to ISO. And we really focus on safety, not on uh, interoperability, because we know that AEF is doing it. So we really want to avoid duplication of work. And then getting back to what we are doing, we, uh, we've been working on, uh, originally on the general requirements for, for the safety of autonomous functions. So you mentioned it. It is ISO 18497 <laughs> series. It's, we hope it will be published this year. And based on this standard, we are now developing, working on use cases the main one, we uh, identified a list of priorities. The first one is soil working and spraying. And so um, for soil working, we spent some time to first doing a risk assessment all together. Uh, and uh, because it was really, it was new with, I would say, newcomers in, in, in the process. And because also we are um, uh, uh, facing new, new issues. 
So it was really important to have a risk assessment to be sure that everybody agreed of what were the issues. And now, little by little, we, we are developing some technical requirements. So the idea is to uh, be able to um, uh, set a proposal, which would be already validated by the industry, and to push it then to ISO when there are other parties represented. A lot of work to do and to, <laughs> and to manage. Indeed. And, and, and we actually need the support of all the industry here in, uh, towards this, uh, this standardization. Um, AEF has a 15 long history now. It was born in 2008, in 2008. 2018. 2008, 2008 yep. yeah. And uh, well, I believe here is coming a new milestone maybe, which is the automation and robotics. So what's the activity and the perspective of AEF towards these uh, subjects? Yeah. Um, so. It's fair to say that um, from the AEF point of view, we've been watching this space for, for some time. We've seen the way the industry's kind of been ramping up the amount of uh, companies that have been uh, releasing autonomous solutions. And we've always, if you like, had this uh, question mark, do we need to create uh, a, a team within the AEF to investigate technical issues with autonomy? And let's say it's a question we've been considering for some time. We ended up having a couple of workshops, one towards the end of last year, one in the middle of uh, 2022, actually at the AEM headquarters. Um, and we invited some speakers from the industry to come and talk about what they're doing in, in autonomy. In the first workshop, it was more, let's say, industry or organization perspectives. Um, and then in the second workshop, we dug down and we actually invited some manufacturers to come and tell us what they were doing in autonomy. And then we had a, a workshop, there was around uh, 40 people present last no November when we met at Fede Unicoma. Um, we had a discussion and we worked out that, yes, there is actually a need for the AEF to do something in this space. Um, there are some areas of if you like, the autonomous uh, um, uh, environment, which should be standardized, and that would help all of us. There are also some areas which should be left alone because everybody can then have their own IP, depending on where you're looking in this kind of uh, ecosystem. So we've decided we're going to form a new team, which, apologies for the name, we're, we're not very inventive. Currently, it's going to be called the Autonomous Oversight Committee, but. We might work on that in the next month or so. Um, <laughs> so we're forming this new team. Uh, we're expecting to have a kind of a kickoff meeting in about a month, between one and two months' time, where we invite all the AEF member companies to, to participate. And the idea of this team is that, first of all, they need to look at, you know, in the autonomous environment, what are all the different interfaces? Once that's kind of documented and hopefully a wonderful picture, we can then try and work out what are the ones that, that should be standardized. What are the ones that we then leave alone? And then once we've worked out what we think are the interfaces which should be standardized, then obviously you know, we've got all these other project teams within the AEF who are actively doing things. And so then the, the sort of remit of this group is to go, to go, okay, if this is an interface which needs to be standardized, do we have an existing team where we can give them this activity or, or do we need to do something else here? So the idea is we want to look at the whole picture, work out the interfaces which should be standardized, and then see if we have something existing in the AEF or we need to create another team for that. And I mean, I, I mentioned Tim too. I mentioned, sorry, I mentioned Tim and the need to evolve Tim to work without an operator. We do have a, a, a team working today on Tim, so that would be a task for them. But yeah, in the end, we've, you know, we've been looking at this space, we've decided in our normal sort of AEF speed that yes, we need to do something. We've agreed we're, gonna, we're going to create this team and within about a month or two, there'll be an invite going out to members to see if they want to participate in this oversight committee to look at the, the interfaces for autonomy. There's an invitation to the audience here. To... Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, assuming you're all AEF members, look out for this letter coming in via the, via the email and Again, it should be 
around about the middle of March. You should be seeing, hold on, yeah, March. You should be seeing that, um, inviting people to participate. And you remember that AEF works because we have all these member companies. Um, they have engineers, they have product marketing people, product support people, and they dedicate some of their time to the AEF to collaborate on, if you like, interoperability, and that's what it's all about. So I, I think it's moving forward, it's gonna be quite exciting to see how this develops. And you know, if you look at the people that are here on this panel today, we're all participating in the same space, and we're all trying to work out how can we contribute without stepping on other people's toes. And I think really based on the cooperation and the communication we have today, we're moving in the right direction, we're moving forward in the right direction um, together, which is great. Yep. Thank you, and going towards this direction, I would f f finally end over to Mr. Rainbow. Thank you for, for waiting. I'd like you to share your presentation, I give you uh, as an insight of what's happening um, a little bit deeper in, in Australia. Okay, we can see it. Floor is yours. Thank you. you can see that clearly. Oh, yep. Terrific. No, thank you again for the opportunity. Apologies that I have been unable to attend in person this this year. Um, but just to share with you that uh, Australia uh, is market ready for large machine autonomy. There's um, the industry is actually very um, proactive at, at a grower level and at the producer level in terms of um, looking at autonomy. As I mentioned before, there's few regulatory barriers to autonomy uh, on farm in Australia, um, but uh, essentially it's large trail, uh, large scale tractor autonomy is, is the key priority area at the moment for industry, um, particularly in the grains uh, and broad acre cropping industries. Um, and consequently, we work together with uh, grain producers of Australia, the Precision Agriculture Association and the Tractor and Machinery Association, including a number of the key manufacturers um, globally that um, are quite uh, active here in this country on development of a code of practice for machine autonomy. So it's really a ground up approach, I suppose, to addressing the lack of um, a regulatory framework here specifically in this country. And what we've done is we've actually followed the, the mining industry model. Um, as you can imagine, we looked at issues like operational hazard management, um, a, a key area, and maybe we can go to questions on this afterwards, is, is this area of vehicle transport between fields. Like the code of practice, says, essentially, you must manually drive the machine from field to field. Now, that all becomes much more difficult when you don't have a seat or a steering wheel or a cabin or, or whatever on a, on a piece of equipment. And, and in fact, uh, a, a grower at Moree, uh, Gary Kirsten, just has bought five uh, ag seed uh, machines and he's going to be faced with the same challenge. Actually, how do you get those machines from field to field? Because in Australia, a, a tractor to drive on a public road needs to be registered. And of course, if you can't register it, it becomes a problem. So it's a key gap in terms of where we need to discuss. One of the, the, the areas that, that um, I suppose created some real discussion um, in development of the code was the area of pesticide application. We've envisaged about 60% of the autonomous uh, robot tractors and, and equipment in Australia will be used for pesticide application. Um, and that's a large amount. And the question is, under the, the AgVet uh, pesticide uh, regulations here in this country, essentially we are required to observe spray deposition in the weather. And so the question is, how do you do that remotely or, or when the machine's operating autonomously and you may not be directly present in the field? And, it's, it's opened up a lot of discussion about how to address that and I've actually focused a lot of my own time recently in terms of advanced sensor development to manage more the environmental safety risks so that we can actually comply with the pesticide regulations, not specifically the, the autonomy or robotics regulations but pesticide environment regulations here in this country. Um, maintenance and repair, um, right to repair, that's another discussion, but essentially it was unanimously agreed that you don't want people tweaking or manipulating uh, or um, pot rotting, it might be a better term for any of this autonomous equipment. We need um, the integrity and function of the equipment to remain sound and, and so how that's maintained, but the, the question is how do you maintain and, and, and monitor that remotely, so that's a key challenge as well. 
the really big one that came out in discussions and, and discussing with the OEM uh, technical working group, uh, so the OECD technical working group on robotics, um, was this area of fire management. Um, as you can imagine, you might have seen news in Australia, fire has been a big ch challenge here in this country from time to time and they're catastrophic when we have them. And the question of, of fire safety, insurance and all these sorts of things if you operate remotely is a key challenge. So again, the environmental sensors and the sensing equipment that we need to manage that risk is a bit of a gap at the moment, a bit like a pesticide uh, monitoring area. Um, the last bit is, is incident reporting, and it's something that uh, is an important part of the code. So if you've got a near miss or something goes wrong, how do we actually manage that as an industry? How do we learn from that? Um, and how do we then in, inform, I suppose, government and, and various agencies because in the future, Australia may see some form of regulation, particularly maybe in terms of how artificial intelligence plays in, but we're, we're probably um, going to be operating under a code for some time. I've just got a couple more slides and then I'm done. Um, so importantly, the code's just for um, on-farm operational equipment, uh, mobile equipment. Um, it doesn't include the use for on public roads or public lands. It actually excludes a forestry. Forestry is a different area together and has increased complexities. Because of the human uh, robotic interface type issues, you've got people present around the machines operating, creates extra challenges. Um, but uh, most recently, the Queensland Government in particular has made direct references in the process of in, in endorsing the code uh, through their Rural Plant Code of Practice. So we're actually starting to get state government um, recognition of the Code of Practice here in this country, which is terrific. And there's been a lot of interest overseas in, in the code that we've developed here. And we're always happy to share our learnings and experiences from that. And, and consequently, it will evolve uh, as the uh, technology starts to become, become more widespread. We actually now have a stage two program underway, particularly looking at induction training programs under the code. So that's Something. If you want to scan that QR code, otherwise uh, just Google uh, Code of Practice Machine Autonomy Australia, you'll, you'll probably find it. But we've got all these key sections in there that help us um, understand the risks and how to manage them. And it's been very much grow up um, and industry led from the ground up, which has been a key part of this. Um, we have incorporated learning from existing user experience. We're fortunate we've actually had a lot of experience. You can see the picture behind me is a swarm farm robot. So we've actually had a lot of practical experience. In fact, there's over a million uh, hectares of operations of those robots to date and you know, 115,000 hours of operation. So extensive use of that type of equipment. There's been opportunity to learn from that. Um, it's been important to develop it in, in uh, parallel with the existing emerging standards and we've been really grateful uh, for a number of people who have been involved in the, in the um, development of the new ISO codes, um, providing us feedback in terms of how we develop with that. But I suppose it's been transparent both in Australia and internationally and we're a long way away from everyone else but we do need to stay connected. I'm always happy to talk to other agencies and, and organisations about our experiences here and and, and share our learnings. Um, but probably the key thing is the code of practice of success really required partnership with all levels. Um, you know, industry producers, the scientific uh, and technical uh, community, and also the manufacturing community. And that's been a, a key part of it. So I'll just finish the presentation there, but, um, and, and maybe we can go back to questions. May, may, okay, this, this is working. <laughs> okay, sorry for that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Rainbow. Uh, clock is is uh, is running, so uh, I will stop here all the presentation and leave room for some uh, some question for the audience. So I I will give you this mic so everybody can. Okay, this works again. Any question over there? <clears throat> We, we've talked a lot about uh, regulation and constraint. 
Um, but do you also think, like for example in the EU, there is some regulation that is coming that is more insensitive uh, for robotics? Like for example, the fact that there is a regulation coming for soils could develop new use cases for robotics and more insensitive for farmers to switch uh, from standard protocol to robotics. Uh, what's your viewpoint on that? Mm. C could you repeat the question a little bit louder, please? I don't know if you had the same. Uh, sure, oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, like we talked about about uh, constraint and regulation, like negative regulation. Um, but for example, in the EU, there is a regulation for soil coming that might uh, provide insensitive to farmers to switch uh, to robotics instead of standards method. So um, what's your viewpoint on future uh, positive regulation that might come in the future. Would you like to take off? I, I believe, and if to, to, to maybe reinterpret, um, speaking of regulations and incentives, I think is what you were getting to, I, if I heard you, heard you correctly, and, and incentives for, for farmers to uh, adopt new technologies, perhaps for you know, societal benefit reasons, whether that's sustainability or, or otherwise. And I think, I, I think they kind of go hand in glove. I mean, uh, again, mon many of the regulations that, that are, uh, uh, we're faced as an industry are directly uh, related to sustainability issues or societal issues. And so I think, uh, you know, we as, we as AEM in North America are, are big advocates of if there's going to be a regulation thrust upon an industry, that requires them to do something different, make, it, make an investment in something different, then there should be incentives in place to make sure that that happens. And sustainability is a perfect opportunity for that. I believe your question from the previous panel uh, was, was dealing with, uh, you know, how, do you, how does autonomy and autonomous equipment uh, address sustainability issues? And the answer is, it absolutely does. But the other answer is, that's not necessarily why farmers are buying it. That's the, that's the added benefit. And I think that's kind of the really fun story for us to, to continue to talk about. If the incentives are there to save the world or to save society or save the planet, that's great. And farmers should be able to take advantage of that. But then in the meantime, reap all of the benefits of the, uh, the technology that allows their operations to be more efficient, more effective, uh, uh, and stand on their own. Yeah. Um Actually, the regulations we have mentioned are applying to equipment. And maybe we gave a, an image of negative regulation, but we want to have a fair regulation. We want to have, uh, of course, we want to, to, to cover the safety of operators. No problem about that. What we want to avoid is to be so restricted that um, there are too many uh, administrative burden on the manufacturer's shoulders first, and besides that, all the innovative solutions cannot be developed. This is what we are, uh, what we want to avoid, and this is why sometimes, uh, um, maybe the way I presented was really seemed to be a bit negative, but. Uh, some, some proposals which were put on the table when we had a discussion, for example, on the machinery regulation were really uh, highly restrictive for manufacturers. And so we have to find the right balance. I think this is why we have so many uh, uh, parties represented in these discussions. So we have uh, industry, but we have also member states arriving with some uh, requests. We have users. And so we have to, find, to try to find the right balance. At the end, what we think in the, that is that the machinery regulation represents this balance um, result. Thank you. And well, we have no time anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> I would like to thank you, Mr. Carblaze, Andrew Oliver, Christophe Tissier, Yoshiyuki Kawase, Mr. Rohan Rainbow for being with us. An applause to them and thank you for your insights. <laughs>